Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm gonna be wrapping up all of my reading for the month of January. You may wanna settle in, get a snack, get a drink, cause we're gonna be here for a while. I read a lot in January. I do feel like January is often one of my highest reading months of the year, maybe because it's a fresh year and I'm just like, fully committed. Also, I listen to a lot of audiobooks this month, more than I usually do, so I think that's part of how I got through as much as I did. So I just kind of want to like say, I know I usually read a lot, but this month I read even more than I typically do. I would not expect anything near this for February. That said, if you're new to my wrap-ups, the way that I do this is I start by talking about all of my reading stats for the month. I am a stats nerd. I enjoy this. If you want to skip forward to where I start talking about the books, you are welcome to do so. Um, but I'm going to be talking stats. And then after that, I will talk about all the books that I read, beginning with my DNFs, books that I chose not to finish, and my lowest rated books, moving up to my highest rated books. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive into my statistics. January 2022 might be the most things that I have ever read in a month. I read, wait for it, 41 books. Yes. How? I don't, I don't know. Um, I will note this does include a couple of poetry collections and some novellas and a couple of short stories, but I also read some big fantasy tomes. I don't know how I did this except that I did have a lot more rereads than usual, which we'll get to, and so I'm wondering if maybe that's part of what let me get through so much more than I typically do because I was rereading stories I was already familiar with. I don't I don't know. Anyway, point being, this month I read a total of 14,036 pages. That is definitely more than usual. My usual average is like 11 to 12,000 pages in a month. This is an average of 453 pages per day. So yes, I did read a lot. This month I had three DNFs, so we will talk about that, books I chose not to finish. I'll talk about how much of them I read and why. 20 of the books that I read were either ARCs, advanced reader copies, or books that were sent to me for review. So about half of my reading, I am working to make that percentage lower, so I'm hoping moving forward in future months, but I did knock out a lot of things in January. This month I did not read any graphic novels. I read two indie published titles. I read one work of translated fiction, and I had five rereads. So like I said, a lot of big books that were rereads I'd read before, which I think helped me get through maybe more than usual. I told you I listened to a lot of audiobooks, so let's talk about it. Uh, in January, I listened to 28 audiobooks. <laughs> 28. Oh my god. Normally my audiobooks make up about half of my reading. For January, it was obviously significantly more. I read nine physical books and four ebooks, so predominantly audiobooks this month. And again, in future months, I expect to see that shift back to my more typical levels. This month 13 of the audiobooks I listened to are what I term shelf, which means I had a physical copy of them on my TBR shelf and I got them off via audio. And in terms of where those audiobooks were coming from, 10 of them were from Audible, 5 of them were from my library, 2 of them were from Chirp, 4 of them were audio review copies from NetGalley, 4 of them were audio review copies from the Penguin Random House Volumes app, and 3 of them were influencer review copies from Libro FM. If you're interested in checking out Libro FM, I do have a link for them down below. They offer some review copies to influencers in exchange for talking about their program. If you are an audiobook listener, they are fantastic. A portion of their proceeds goes to support indie bookstores, so check them out. Looking at age categories, I was mostly reading books for adult audiences. This is probably not a huge surprise, continuing on trend from last year. This month, 33 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, eight of them were targeted at a YA audience, and none of them were targeted at a middle grade audience. Next up, let's look at publication dates. In January, the earliest published book I read was from 1962. 21 of the books that I read were published prior to 2021, so backlist titles. Two of them were 2021 releases and 17 of them were 2022 releases. So I am fully moving into my 2022 review copies this month. Looking at author demographics, I'm doing decently well with this. Every month my goal is to read around 50% from Black, Indigenous, or Person of Color authors and around 25% queer authors. In January, 46% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, so not quite there, but fairly close, and 19.5% of the books that I read were by queer authors who are publicly part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so yeah, like 
pretty pleased with that. I am finding that because I have so many read-alongs that are like these fantasy books by primarily white authors, I am having to like actively think about what else I'm putting on my TBR to make sure that I'm hitting some of those goals, but it is something that I value and something I find important to expose myself to other people's experiences and support diverse voices. It's one of the things that I try to do on this platform, so that's something I'm making happen. Moving on, let's look at the genres that I read. This month, my most read genre was definitely fantasy. 15 of the books that I read were part of the fantasy genre, so that was a big part of it. My second most read genre was romance. The, like, is this surprising to anybody who watches me regularly? No, probably not. Those are usually my two most read genres. This month, five of those romances were contemporary romances, two were historical romances, and one was speculative romance. I also read three sci-fi books, two thrillers, two poetry collections, two general nonfiction titles, and I should note that for 2022 I am dividing my nonfiction books into three categories. So last year I did just nonfiction as a larger sort of category. This year I'm interested in drilling down a little bit more, so now I have general nonfiction, memoir, and history and biography as my three nonfiction categories. So two general nonfiction titles, two memoirs, two contemporary fiction, one historical fiction, one history or biography, one horror, one literary fiction, and one mystery. So I was really getting to like most of the genres this month, which is kind of fun. Lastly, let's look at star ratings and you're going to see that despite my high amount of reading, <laughs> my star ratings trended pretty low this month, so I had some real misses. This month one book got one star, one book got one and a half stars, two books got two stars, four books got two and a half stars, six books got three stars, two books got three and a half stars, ten books got four stars, seven books got four and a half stars, five books got five stars, and this month three books got six stars, which in my personal rating scale is what I give to a favorite of the year. And let me tell you, these three all happen in rapid succession right at the end of the month. So I went through most of January thinking, oh my god, I'm not gonna have any new favorite books. And then thankfully, I, I finally got over whatever reading hump I was in. <laughs> like reading desert and like found some new favorites. So that was very exciting. Um, okay, last thing is let's take a look at my progress on the reading challenges that I set for myself for 2022. This year I had eight classics and eight sci-fi fantasy books I wanted to get to and I have made a little bit of progress. I have read two of the eight classics and I have not yet read any of the sci-fi fantasy books. Okay, so those are my stats. Like I said, we're probably going to be here for a minute because I have a lot to talk about. I may have to take a lunch break somewhere in here. I don't know. We're going we're gonna to try to get through this in as timely a manner as possible. First, let's talk about my DNFs. I had three of them this month, and I didn't talk about any of these in my mid-month wrap-up. I should note that some of these books I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. I will link that video up above. For those books, I'm just going to tell you the title and the star rating, and if you want to hear detailed thoughts on those, you can check out that earlier video. Three DNFs. All of them were books that I had for review, which is unfortunate because I do try to do my best to pick books that I think I'm going to enjoy, and in this case I had some books that just were missing for me for different reasons. My first DNF was a fantasy novella called The Long Game by K.J. Parker. I read 27% of this novella before deciding to DNF it, and this is kind of a bummer. I had heard a lot of really good things about K.J. Parker. I know a lot of people enjoy his fantasy, and I'd been interested to try something from him. And you know, often for me a novella can be a great entry point into an author's work if I haven't read from them before. So I was like, oh, let me try this. I saw that it was available from NetGalley, so I picked it up and man this just <laughs> this just didn't work for me. I struggled to read the first 27% and I was like I do not want to keep reading this. Some of it was things that I didn't like like the fact that the world setup had a lot of misogyny built into it which I wasn't a huge fan of and that is something that you can run into reading fantasy from you know older white dudes that kind of can come with the territory. Not always, but sometimes. And, you know, I don't love when that's built into the world building in such a big way, which in this novella it was. Didn't love that. But also I just didn't really like the voice and the writing style. The type of humor wasn't working for me. 
the it was it felt a little bit chaotic and yeah I just kind of think this may not be the author for me because it seems like people who love his work really enjoyed this novella so your mileage is really going to vary on this but it was a it was a try for me of a new author who I know a lot of people enjoy and kind of a miss so I'm likely not going to pick anything else up from him I just kind of get the vibe that his writing style isn't going to work for, great for me and I was not liking the direction this novella specifically was going so I DNF'd it. My next DNF I'm sad about and I, I have conflicted feelings about this book because I can see what it's trying to do and I can see that there is value in the narrative that it's telling but I don't think the marketing really set me up well for what to expect from it and unfortunately this is just a book that I don't want to read and I, I wouldn't necessarily steer other people away from it. I would just want to set you up for knowing what it is that you're getting from it. This is Redwood and Wildfire by Andrea Hairston. I read the first 155 pages of it. I really pushed myself to keep reading this book longer than I maybe wanted to because I was hoping I would get into it and I really wanted to give it a solid chance. This was originally published as an indie title and is now getting traditionally published from Tor.com and when I finally went and looked at some of the reviews for this book, I saw somebody say that this is kind of like if Zora Neale Hurston wrote a fantasy novel. And that I think is much closer to the truth of what this book is than a lot of what the marketing has made it sound like. It's set in the American South at the turn of the 20th century. There is a lot of trauma in this narrative. It's a lot to read and I don't think I went in expecting so much of it and I didn't know it was going to do some of the things it did and some of some of the specific types of trauma that this touches on are things that I'm more bothered by and don't want to read and probably would have stayed away from if I had known that this was in the book. So just like a heads up for potential readers. We have two main characters in the story. One is a black girl who has some kind of witchy abilities. She's 12 years old when the story begins when her mom is killed by a lynch mob. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, there's a lot of trauma just from the get go. When the narrative really starts picking up, she is about 15. And then by the time I stopped reading, she was 17, just to kind of give you an idea of her age and the progression of time. Our other main character is a mixed race man. He is Irish and Seminole, so in, um, from the Seminole tribe, but is white passing. He is an alcoholic and a domestic abuser. And uh, it, it is clear that the the arc of the story is a romance between him and our female main character. And I'm gonna be honest, this sort of friendship that they start developing when she's 15 years old and he's a full-grown man feels like grooming. And, you know, she's 17 when they acknowledge the attraction, but it, I didn't, I didn't really want to read it. There is also an on-page essay scene with her and a white man, not the other character, but he happens upon her while that essay is taking place. And she does end up killing her abuser, but um, still, it's a lot. It's like on-page. So I... From what I understand, this book ends up being hopeful, and a lot of it is about you know, redemption and love and community and stuff like that. But it goes through some very, very dark places to eventually get there. And especially because I think ultimately you do have this relationship between these two people that began in this way that I'm so uncomfortable with. Plus the fact that I was struggling with the narrative because it is very meandering. I had a hard time really getting into the style of writing. So just overall there were a lot of reasons that I was like I really don't want to be reading this book. And I do feel bad because I know there are people who have read this book and really loved it. I know there are some important thematic things here and like can we have a redemption arc for a domestic abuser? Possibly, but like do I want to read it in the context of him sort of having this relationship that feels like grooming with a child? No, not really. Um, so yeah, I, I just think like your mileage on this is going to vary. I know there are people who have really loved this. I know that it is capturing a specific moment in time. I know it's capturing a lot of historic realities for um, Black and Indigenous folks who were living during that time, and it's got important thematic content. But personally, 
it does some things that I didn't really want to read. And yes, that was kind of a struggle for me. So heads up for anybody picking it up, know that that is what this is. That said, some of you might hear that and be like, oh my gosh, yeah, I want to pick it up. It does also have magical elements and like blues music and stuff. So th this is going to be a great book for some people but I'm not sure that the marketing has done a very effective job of giving people a sense of what it is. So I decided to DNF it. And uh, yeah, I may try to pass this on to somebody who would get on better with it than I did. My final DNF is another one that I'm bummed about. And another one where I'm going to say your mileage is really going to vary because early reviews mostly are pretty positive for this book. I had a historical romance for review from an author I've read from before and really enjoyed. This was Good Girl's Guide to Rakes by Eva Lee. And I read 37% of this book. And look, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing like objectively bad about it. I just was not at all invested. I got to, you know, almost the 40% mark in the book and did not care about the characters, didn't care if they got together at the end. And like the actual writing is fine. The concept is cool. The girl has kind of always been a good girl who wants to be exposed to other things. The hero's rake who needs to find a wife in good standing with society. So they make a swap. She will introduce him to women in polite society and he will secretly take her to London's underground, which is like a fun setup. She writes good steamy romances and I have really loved some of the books I've read from her in the past, but for whatever reason this one just was not vibing with me, didn't particularly care about either of the characters, and I was like, I just, like, I don't want to be reading this right now. So it's kind of a bummer. There are other reviewers who seem to be really loving it, so you may get on better with it than I did, but at least for me this was kind of a miss and I decided to DNF. That said, let's go ahead and talk about the 41 books that I did finish reading this month. <laughs> Side note, I recently tried this bubbly blueberry pomegranate sparkling water for the first time and it is delicious. I love this flavor. I will definitely be getting it again. This month I had my first one star of the year and I'm not going to say anything about it here because I have talked about it at length. I have a vlog where I read this and one other book and I did talk a little bit about it in my mid-month wrap-up. I will link that vlog up above but I gave one star to Verity by Colleen Hoover. Check out that vlog if you want to hear my very detailed thoughts. I gave one book one and a half stars and again I don't want to get into it a lot here because I also have a reading vlog for this but I ended up giving one and a half stars to Anxious People by Frederick Bachman. This is a controversial opinion but I think based on the comments that video has gotten he is a polarizing author so there are definitely readers who had the same feelings and experiences with his writing as I did. And there are other readers who feel very differently and who really love the way that he writes and even loved anxious people and it worked for them. So, you know, this is one where just depending on what works for you and doesn't, it may vary. Personally, I felt like this book was really emotionally manipulative in the way that it did its character development. And I don't like that. Some people aren't bothered by that, but I don't really like it, especially when it's done in this specific way. And there were a lot of other things. So if you want to hear my full thoughts, I will link that reading vlog up above. This was a miss for me. And I don't know that I'm going to try anything else from him. Just because the response has been so polarized. I've had some people say, yeah, I didn't like this one from him either. But I loved X, Y, and Z. And then I've had other people say, oh, I haven't read that. But I read this other book that the other people recommended. And I had the same experience with that book. So I don't I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe. I will try something else from him at some point in the future, but it's not going to be a big priority for me. And this isn't a type of fiction that I usually gravitate towards anyway. I mostly wanted to try it because people just sort of rave about his work, but I kind of think he may just not be the author for me. In January, I gave one book two stars and I talked about it in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is to Sir Philip with Love by Julia Quinn. Check out that video if you want to hear more. Then I gave four books two and a half stars and two of them I have talked about in other places. I gave two and a half stars to It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover, which I talked about in the same vlog where I read Verity. I also sadly gave two and a half stars to The Love Con by Ceresia Glass. I'm still bummed about this, but it did some things that specifically don't work for me. I talked about this at greater length in my bin month wrap up. I also gave two and a half stars to Royal Valentine 
by Jen McKinley. This is a romance novella that I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley. This wasn't the worst thing, but it wasn't really good either. I feel like because it is a novella and it is so quick to get through, I'm not like mad at its shortcomings the way I would have been if it was a full length novel. And I do think that for me and for some other people, novellas like this can make a good palate cleanser if you just want something kind of fun and light in between other books. And so I wouldn't necessarily steer people away from it, but I would just say set your expectations. One thing that this book does is it tries to cram a full length novel's worth of plot into a novella, which is an interesting choice and I'm not sure it's done super well. And then like the ending, I just didn't by at all. It sets up this whole conflict where our heroine has major trust issues because of her past and hates people lying to her. And our hero ends up lying to her because it turns out he's like, he's not a royal really, but he's like an, a duke or an earl or something, you know, something like that. The point is that he lies to her. And then at the end, it kind of glosses over that in the way that it does the resolution. I, I just like didn't find it believable. So two and a half stars. It wasn't terrible and at least it was short. But um, if you're looking for something more than just a palate cleanser, maybe look somewhere else. I also unfortunately ended up giving two and a half stars to The Order of the Pure Moon Reflected in Water by Zen Sho. I, um, I have complicated feelings about this novella and I don't think I've really heard people talking so much about this, so I, I want to talk about it. I generally really love Tor.com novellas, and I loved the cover, and somebody had an arc they were getting rid of, so I was like, yeah, like, give it to me, let me try this. And this is kind of sold as, like, a found family wuxia-inspired fantasy, which, like, questionable whether it's totally that, first of all. The story itself is fine. Like, it's charming. It has its moments. I enjoyed it reasonably well. Like, I think if it wasn't for the issue that I'm going to talk about, this would have been like a three star read for me, like perfectly fine. Nothing that I found super memorable, but like, cool. Here's the thing, though, one of the main characters in this book is a trans guy. And the revelation that he is trans is treated kind of as a plot twist and happens in a way that he didn't choose or consent to. And on top of that, I'm not sure this does the best job of handling his trans identity. For instance, there are multiple instances of other characters misgendering him and it's not always challenged on page. So like heads up while the writing itself is quite nice i liked her pro style and the story itself was fine that is going to be an issue for some people and i think particularly for trans folks it's possible that you could find that triggering and this isn't something i've seen people talk about it seems like there's a lot of reviewers who are sort of like hey there's trans reps yay and i'm like yeah but like is it done great? If you check out my Goodreads review, and my Goodreads is always linked in the video description down below, I link to a Own Voices review of this book from a trans reviewer, and uh, that review was quite negative in the way that it, it talked about this issue. So something worth noting for people who have it on your radar, I don't think it necessarily handles that super well. From what we know, the author is a cis woman, but you never really know. So I want to be a little bit careful about, you know, saying anything about the author's handling of it or experiences or whatever. I don't know that for a fact, but I can say that I think the way this handles things could be hurtful to some trans folks. So for me, this was a two and a half star read. Moving on, let's talk about my three star reads. This month, there were six of them, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book is Echoes and Empires by Morgan Rhodes. If you want to hear about that, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave three stars to Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Umoja Noble. So this is an academic nonfiction title that is very heavily theoretical, more than practical. And I had the audiobook, so I listened to it on audio. I think there's a lot to like here and I think this book is laying some really important theoretical groundwork in the social sciences for the study of the problems with Google and other search engines and the way that it handles race. I think this book is offering some important places for future work and study and I didn't get the feeling reading reviews that everybody really understood 
number one, everything that this book was trying to do, but number two, that it was a, a very, very much an academic press book that was intended to lay theoretical groundwork. There were people being critical for the fact that there wasn't more practical application, and there isn't, but I think that's intentional. It's that that's not really the project of the book. I think it's pretty good for what it is. There are some places where I didn't love the opinion it took on certain things. This is one where I'm going to point you if you're interested to my Goodreads review where I get into a little bit more of the nitty gritty of this. I don't know that this is going to appeal to everyone, but I do think it has some really interesting things to say. I will say this is not the most accessible title from an academic perspective. She uses a lot of field specific language that has depths of meaning and theory behind it in the fields of communication and feminist studies and other other things. And so I think your average reader coming to this book isn't going to know a lot of that and is probably going to miss a lot of the depth of what's happening because she assumes a lot of that knowledge. Because I have a master's degree in related fields, I came in knowing a lot of that stuff. So I was able to understand a lot of what she was saying, but it, she doesn't really like hold your hand through it. It's written for a more academic audience. So just kind of be aware of that. Yeah. So three stars. I liked it. I didn't love it. I, you know, had some quibbles with it, but I do think that's a good book and I'm glad that I read it. I ordered lunch today and it's arriving early. So I'm going to take a break, eat some lunch, and then I will be back to talk about more of these books. <laughs> back from my lunch break, but I have to go pick my kids up from school in a little while. So I'm going to do my best to get through the rest of these books before I have to leave and do that. But if I'm unable to, I'll just have to make another clip later. The next book that I gave three stars to was Digging Up Love by Chandra Bloomberg. This is a really cute premise and I had seen it on Twitter and ordered it. Our heroine is a baker and weightlifter and our hero is a paleontologist, which sounds like a really cute setup. There were a lot of things that I liked about this, but I also found some things really irritating about the characters inability to have direct conversations and face conflict. And this was true of both of them, but the heroine in particular, like, would not deal directly with issues and conflict in her life. And I found that to be a little bit frustrating. But in general, I think it's a pretty cute romance. And it is, I think, fade to black. So for people looking for things that aren't so steamy, this might be one to give a try. It is available on Kindle Unlimited. I also gave three stars to The Red Palace by June Her. This was a review copy that I had on NetGalley. And this is one where I'm kind of bummed I didn't love it more. While I liked it pretty well, and I think that June Her is doing something really important in that she's writing YA mysteries set in historical Korea and is clearly doing a ton of research. This one was a little bit of a mixed bag for me. I found it sort of slow going to get through while the historical piece of it was interesting and the actual plot point of the mystery were interesting. I do feel like the pacing is pretty slow for genre fiction because it spends a lot of time on the historical pieces of it. So it takes a while for things to happen. And the more formal style of writing makes you feel a little bit at arm's length from the characters, at least from my experience. So I liked this. I liked a lot of what it was doing. I thought it had a lot of really interesting historical context. I liked the basic plot. It follows a young woman who works as a nurse in the palace in 1700s Korea and uh, there's a serial murderer and she's trying to figure out who it is. And there is a side romance. So I liked this, but I didn't love it in the way I was hoping to. That said, there are a lot of people who really, really love her work, which I think is great. I do think though that if you're more of a historical fiction reader and you go into this thinking of it as a historical fiction with a murder mystery plot engine, you might get on better with it. I, I don't know that my expectations were quite there and historical fiction isn't my usual genre of choice. I also gave three stars to Electric Idol by Katie Robert. This is the sequel to Neon Gods, which is basically a modern erotic romance that is loosely based on Greek mythology. This one follows Eros and Psyche, and I do think that for people whose complaint about Neon Gods was that there wasn't enough plot, you might like this better. It does have a lot more plot to it. Personally, though, I just really loved the relationship dynamic in Neon Gods more. Like, this was fine, but I just didn't care as much for the couple. I did really like the fact that our heroine is plus size and bisexual. That was cool to see, and I feel like she does a really good job with positive fat representation in this book, so that is a good reason to pick it up. So I liked this. I enjoyed it. I'll probably keep reading in the series, but it's not 
personally my favorite installment. That said, I could see some people enjoying this a lot more than Neon Gods depending on what their preferences are. And my final three star read was The Sweetheart Deal by Miranda Liaison. I had this sent to me by the publisher for a review and I also had an audio review copy on Neck Alley so I did listen to the audiobook. This is a small town marriage of convenience plot with feuding families and I liked it. I think it's pretty cute. It has very charming moments. It's another one that is kind of closed or fade to black so if you're looking for something that doesn't get very steamy this might be a book to try out. It is another one where I didn't love the way that it handled the conflict between the couple and you know in, in this kind of book you frequently will get sort of your third act breakup before they finally get together again and I felt like they went a little bit far in terms of doing hurtful things to each other during that and I don't know that that it, the, the resolution was adequate for me. But again, this was cute. It was a small town romance. They're trying to save their family businesses, her family's bakery and his family's Italian restaurant, but the families had been feuding for all of these years. So, uh, you know, if that sounds up your alley, it's worth a look. I gave it three stars. Then in January, I had two books got three and a half stars, and I did talk about both of these in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are The Kissing of Kissing, Poems by Hannah Emerson, and Guns of the Dawn by Adrian Tchaikovsky. And if you want to hear more about this, I will link up above a live show that we did over on Leanna's channel. This was the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick for the first quarter of 2022, and we have a live show. I liked it the least, and I still liked it pretty well. So if you want to hear more of a detailed conversation, go check that out. Moving on, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were 10 of them, and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are a History of Wild Places by Shea Earnshaw, Star Child, a biographical constellation of Octavia Estelle Butler by E.B. Zaboy, The Starless Crown by James Rollins, and Wizard's First Rule by Terry Goodkind. We also do have a whole live show discussing this book with me and Leanna, so I will link that up above if you missed it. We're doing a read-along of the whole series throughout the year of 2022. This was my third time reading this book. I also gave four stars to Before They Were Hanged by Joe Abercrombie. This was a reread for me, second time reading it. And I think I felt similarly to this as I did the first time that I read it. I'm not going to say too much about this here because I am doing a whole episode on the podcast that I co-host with Leanna from Leanna's Library. We're doing a read-along of the first law books throughout 2022 and doing podcast episodes on each book. So tune in later in February if you want to hear all of our thoughts and my podcast is linked down below if you want to check that out. You can get it wherever you get your podcasts but also we have the video version on YouTube so uh, reread gave it four stars. I also gave four stars to Edgewood by Kristen Ciccarelli. This is one that I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley. Love the cover. It's a YA but verging on new adult. This does feel more mature to me. Our main character is around 19 and just thematically this this feels more mature than a lot of YA but it's a fantasy story and I really liked it. I thought a lot of it was beautiful and really interesting. I've read from Kristen Ciccarelli before and this is something very different from her. Her other books have been in an alternate world whereas this one is more real world. She's a Canadian author and the main character in this is it living in Canada. She's a singer-songwriter but every time she performs the forest from near where she was raised as a child kind of creeps in on her in these weird ways and then she finds out that her grandfather who raised her and has dementia has disappeared. So she goes back to her childhood home, goes into the woods to try to find him and get him back and will maybe enter the court of the Wood King and there's a lot of like mysterious things. This was really beautiful. It does a lot with memory and love and family. I think people have mixed feelings about some of the twists and some of the ways that some of those things play out so if you need detailed information do check out Goodreads and uh, you can check out my review if you want to hear more but I did really like this quite a lot and I gave it four stars. I also gave four stars to Miss Me With That by Rachel Lindsay. If you are a Bachelor fan, you probably know who Rachel Lindsay is. If you're not, you, you might not be aware, but Rachel Lindsay was the first black bachelorette that we had. I am a fan of the Bachelor franchise with all of its problems, I, I realize, but I've been following it for a long time. And this is her memoir. And I do think that this is a very good version of a celebrity memoir. Those can tend to be pretty hit and miss. She opens up quite a lot about the messiness of her relationships before going on The Bachelor, about her experiences with faith and how that's shaped her life and changed through the course of her life. And I thought that was really interesting. 
she does talk about her time on The Bachelor and as The Bachelorette and does give some really interesting insight into what that was like specifically as a black woman and the kinds of microaggressions she faced, issues with things that the producers did and even made her do in terms of keeping certain people or not giving her certain information. It, it was pretty interesting. And then she ends it by talking a lot about the social activism that she's been a part of and talking about the impact of the deaths of people like Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And um, yeah, I think it's very good. I think it's as, as, as a celebrity memoir, this is among the better ones that I've read. And I think if you have any interest in the Bachelor franchise, it's certainly worth a read. I also gave four stars to Reclaim the Stars, edited by Zoraida Cordova. This is a YA short story anthology. It's sci-fi and fantasy stories from 17 Latinx YA authors, and I think it's a really good anthology. As with any of these sorts of things, I liked some stories better than others, but overall I thought this was very good and there were some fantastic stories in here. There is definitely a lot more fantasy than sci-fi. You get a little bit of sci-fi, but it's just kind of a, a heads up on that, but I really liked it. If you like short story collections, if you like some of the authors involved, I think this is worth a look. And I did have this as a review copy from NetGalley. Next up was an audio review copy that I had. This is Red Lip Theology by Candace Marie Benbow. Candace Marie Benbow is a Black woman theologian. She identifies as a womanist and has a lot to say about modern day Christianity and some of the problems with things like purity culture and homophobia and what might a different kind of theology look like if you want to stay inside the church. And she is specifically talking from the perspective of the black church and she's really clear about that. I liked this quite a lot. It's part memoir, part theology text. And I, I do think it's powerful. It's well worth reading if this is something that's kind of up your alley or something you're thinking about. I like the way she talked about a lot of these issues and she's she's pretty vulnerable even with some of her mistakes and her experiences. She talks about mental health and how the church does not always do a great job of supporting people struggling with their mental health or grieving a loss, which is certainly true. So yeah, um, this is another one I would for sure recommend. She reads the audiobook herself and so that's always a fun way to consume audio when you've got like a memoir type thing. It was, it was good. And my final four star read of the month is another short story collection. This is The Secret Lives of Church Ladies by Disha Filia. I really liked this. It was a National Book Award finalist and I'd heard some really good things about this debut short story collection. And I do think it is very good and very interesting. Several of the stories focus on queer women. I will say a lot of them deal with infidelity, probably more than I would tend to prefer in a collection like this. But again, I'm not really here to police another person's experience of faith and the church and their sexuality and whatever. So like, you know, but I think these are very well executed short stories. The characterization is believable. And I think this explores a lot of the nuances of women in the church, specifically in the black church, and the way that sexuality is policed. There's also like a really cute, more romantic story in here that I just loved so much. What is it? What is it? the title of it? It's called How to Make Love to a Physicist. So if you are a romance reader, you'll probably really enjoy that one. Most of them are not that happy. They have more sobering realities to them. And there's, you know, for sure content warnings in here. But I really like this lot, gave it four stars, and I would definitely pick up something else from this author in the future. Moving on, let's talk about my four and a half star reads. This month there were seven of them and five of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Here to Stay by Adriana Herrera, Little Big Bully by Heidi Erdrich, Servant Mage by Kate Elliott, The Bone Spindle by Leslie Vetter, and We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. If you want to hear about those, check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four and a half stars to the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society by Marianne Schaefer and Annie Barrows. I ended up getting the audiobook of this from my library and I'm so glad I finally read it. I decided to pick it up because this week I'm doing a movie night with my patrons and we're watching the Netflix adaptation of this. So I was like, I would like to finally read it before we watch it. And my library had the audiobook, so I went ahead and downloaded it and listened to it. And it was very charming. I am not usually a big historical fiction reader as I 
mentioned earlier. And I'm especially not usually a big reader of World War II fiction, but I do feel like this is a very different take on it. It's an epistolary novel, so it's told in the form of letters, and it's just really charming. It's about these people on the island of Guernsey that was occupied by German forces during World War II, and kind of about their experiences in the war. And after the war, they're writing these letters to this woman who's kind of a writer and journalist who wants to maybe write about their experiences. And it's just great and charming and funny and has some like romantic plots to it. I really enjoyed it a lot and I am definitely looking forward to checking out the adaptation. The final book that got four and a half stars for me this month was The Kindred by Alicia Dow. This was really good. Alicia Dow has kind of a quirky style of writing which is different from what you're used to but I've really been enjoying it and one thing that's kind of cool about this is it's a sci-fi romance set in the same world as The Sound of Stars but set earlier so you could almost read it as a prequel but it, they're they're both standalone novels but near the end of the book you will see some characters you might recognize if you've read Sound of Stars but you don't have to have read it to read this. It follows two teenagers who are aliens, they're not human, they're from other planets, and there's a program called the Kindred Program that is supposed to help with class warfare and class tensions where at birth a high class person is paired and has a mental bond with a lower class person so they can kind of like see their experiences and hopefully make better policies is the idea. And so he is very high class and she's very very low class and they've been mentally bonded but there's a lot of like political conspiracy things that go on so I'm not going to say too much more about the plot but I really enjoyed this. One thing I didn't expect is partway into the book for reasons they end up on earth and so it's a little jarring going from other planet alien civilization to oh we're now on earth and experiencing that so it was kind of an interesting thing but overall I really liked it. Also our main character is fat, black, and demisexual. Our hero is bisexual so we've got lots of that kind of representation which I think is great. Um, definitely worth a look. Next up is my five star reads. This month there were five of them and I did talk about one of them in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was my reread of Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Check out my mid-month wrap-up to hear more, although I don't say a whole lot about it honestly because it's a reread and I love it. Another book that I reread and gave five stars to was House of Earth and Blood by Sarah J Mass. I did this as a buddy read with Izzy from Happy For Now. It was her first time reading it and my second time and I actually enjoyed it more on a reread than I did the first time. I had such a good time with this. I don't know why it didn't occur to me the first time I read this, but it is structured as a murder mystery and it's such an interesting genre blend because it's sort of like urban fantasy meets paranormal romance meets cozy murder mystery, which sounds like a weird combination, but it really worked for me. It's something quite different from other things she's written. I do think, you know, people who just generally don't like her writing, this isn't gonna like radically change their opinion of it, but this is among my favorite books from her and I had so much fun with it on a reread. I had also forgotten there's a couple of really great caretaking scenes with her taking care of Hunt and I, it was good. I'm excited for the second book. I know not everybody is into her, but I really really love this and I bumped it up from four and a half to five stars on a reread. I also gave five stars to a short story which is a little interesting. This is called The Cleaners by Ken Liu. It was an audible original or an like an Amazon original from a collection of fairy tale retellings. I have never read anything by Ken Liu and I've meant to and reading this short story was like yeah I really need to get around to reading more from him because I loved this and I was so impressed that he took this idea and spun it out into something I wouldn't have expected. So this short story is very loosely inspired by Princess and the Pea and I say very loosely because he kind of like took the basic idea and then imagined a more sci-fi scenario of it. Because the basic thing with the princess and the pea, right, is they know she's a princess because she's so sensitive she can feel a pea at the bottom of this like thing of mattresses. So what he does is he imagines the society where when people touch objects they leave memory residue on them and when most people touch them they experience those emotions and those memories and people have different levels of sensitivity to it and so there are people who are employed as cleaners who have to like clean that residue off them so it's about memory and forgetting and like what makes us human and what does it mean to forget or heal versus just like not remember and then it's also got this thing about like 
capitalism and stuff in it. It's really interesting, but the way it's connected to Princess and the Pea, because people in the review seemed confused by this, so like FYI, one of the characters in the story is a woman who is so sensitive to that residue that when she touches something, she can feel it even after something has been cleaned and she can get to like the intentions and the emotions of like the person who put it there. So she's just like super, super sensitive to the objects. So that's like the loose interpretation piece of it. But I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic short story. I was impressed by how much world building and thematic depth was in this like you know, 60 page story or whatever it was. Like it was pretty short, but it was great. So five stars for me. And I, I clearly need to read more from Ken Leo because I loved his writing. I also gave five stars to The Devil in America by Kaya Shante Wilson. Isn't this adorable? It's like a little, little book. It's a novella and it's only about a hundred pages long, but it really packs a punch. It's a little bit experimental in formatting, which some people seem not to like. I liked it, I didn't mind it. But the main story is following a black girl in the post-Civil War American South, and she can sense spirits. I don't want, I don't, basically I don't wanna to say too much about about this book because it is so short, but thematically it is about how black people who were enslaved and brought over from Africa have lost this connection to their culture and their history and what they should have had passed on to them. That's like really the, the thematic message of this story. And I really liked it. It is quite dark and quite brutal. So like, if you need content warnings for any of that stuff, check it out. But I thought this was very, very good and impressive in how much it fit into a short piece of fiction. I gave it five stars. My final five star read of January was another reread. This is The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. I enjoyed this a lot and it is another one that I think I liked better on a reread than I did on a first time around. And I understand that this doesn't work for everybody and rereading it especially I'm like I totally see why because she's introducing you to a lot of stuff the pacing isn't always perfect and I think the first time you're reading it a lot of it is just trying to like orient yourself to the world that she's created but I just love the world I love the world building I really love some of the main characters I love the political pieces of this like is it perfect no did I have such a great cozy time reading it and was this exactly what I wanted Yes, 100%. Am I super jazzed that she just turned in a manuscript for a prequel book? Yes. Um, I, I would love to revisit this world. I really like it. It was great. Lastly, I had three books that got six stars and in my personal rating scale, that's what I give to a favorite of the year. So that was very exciting that I had three books near the end of the month that made it on that list. The first one is a historical romance and this is the second year in a row that this author has had a romance on my list of favorites. This is A Scoundrel of Her Own by Stacey Reed. This was sent to me for review from the publisher and it came out in December. I love the way Stacey Reed does historical romance. I just love it. Like she writes great characters who I am rooting for. She is socially conscious and deals with bigger social issues, which I enjoy in my romance. And they're steamy. So this is like, it's 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 fantastic and I think it's interesting because it uses issues of like class sometimes to talk about societal inequality and injustices and stuff. Here we have two people who met as children, one from the lower class, one from the upper class, and he has worked his whole life to try to make money to be worthy of her and is now like the lord of the underworld and she is secretly going out in disguise and singing in the underworld because she's on a mission that I won't like get into. He kind of becomes her protector, they reconnect, and it's great. I loved the romance. I loved the commentary. I just this, it was fantastic. So yeah, the best romance I've read so far this year. I also gave six stars to The Parable of the Talents by Octavia E. Butler. Oh man, this book. <laughs> It's like, it's really intense. It gets very dark and bleak before it gets more hopeful and it made me tear up, but I really loved it. Last year I read The Parable of the Sower and this is the sequel. Oh man, like, I don't know what, I don't know how much I can say about this 
without spoiling book one, but this basically continues the story of this woman named Lauren who is like a teenager in book one who has this idea for a religion that she calls Earthseed that continues in this book. One thing that was a trip to read, because I had heard people say, oh my gosh, Octavia Butler's like prophetic, but when I tell you <laughs> in this book, it, which is set in kind of a dystopian America, right? We have this man running for president. He's this white man who is kind of a racist and a religious extremist, and the tagline for his campaign is literally make America great again. This was published in the 90s. <laughs> it's very interesting. It's very interesting. I think this book does a great job of unpacking the politics of religion in America, among other things. Climate change, like there's just, there's so much here. You could have like a whole video on it, but I, I loved it. I was so invested by the end and uh, it gave me feelings. I think this is one thing is I'm realizing that for a book to make it to my list of favorites, like the thing that elevates for me above a five star to like six star favorite of the year is it makes me feel something. And this book made me feel things. So yeah, it was great. I love Octavia Butler's work and I want to continue reading all of it. The last book I'm actually not going to say very much about because I read this for a video project that will be forthcoming sometime in February. And so I'm going to save most of my thoughts for that video. But I read Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation by Kristen Cobbs Dumez. Some of you guys might know I'm a former evangelical. I was raised as a American evangelical. I no longer identify that way. And uh, this man, this was eye-opening, like it explained a lot of things, and it was also very validating to read. And like, I don't usually tab books, but this one I did. And when I initially sat down to talk about this book for this video I'm doing, I talked about just this book for like an hour, over an hour. So I'm gonna have to like seriously cut that down. You will not be getting all of that footage in the final, final product, especially because I still have like four other books to read. But yeah, fantastic. Highly recommend checking this out. Um, I'm not gonna say any more here. I do have a Goodreads review, so if you want a little bit more of my thoughts on it, I would say go there, but I'm gonna save the rest of my commentary for that other video, but um, loved it. So, whew, there you go, we did it. And I am just in time, I can like, finish this up and clean up and go get my kids from school. So yay. If you are still with me, thank you all for watching. Those are all the books that I got through in January. It was a lot of books and I'm just glad that at the end I got some really great ones. And so far, like we're doing pretty good heading into February. So like fingers crossed that continues. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, tell me about a time that you read a book that you liked and then reread it and loved it even more. Because I think sometimes you can reread something and you don't like it as much or you feel the same, but like it is fun to read something that I already knew I was gonna like and then I love it. And um, I'd be curious to hear if you've had that experience before. Let me know in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, it helps if you give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you wanna see more. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time.